class at Harvard Business School, um, an extremely uh, knowledgeable person and someone that's very, very deep in the subject that we're going to be covering today. So we're going to be talking about um, a little bit of a continuation of, of, of in a sense, uh, regulation, but this is a very different thing. This is really about accounting and how should we be thinking about the accounting within the gas emission space matters to us those of you that were with us last year will know that we have our own product in this space uh, a blockchain product um, but i think bob you've got a you've got a broader perspective on this and you've been spending quite some time in in this space so walk us through it share with us and and educate us now um, and uh, and then we'll have some q and a afterwards and i'll ask you a few more questions um, as we go now i do think if we go to the next slide i think this is cpe so just a reminder for everybody as they're watching this this session is cpe eligible so do remember you've got to answer three polls there will be polls coming up uh, you need to watch the whole session and you need to answer all polling questions if you want to have the cpe credit for this session and on that let's Go to the next slide and we can jump right in and over to you, Bob. Okay. So thank you. I'm Bob Kaplan, a professor at Harvard Business School and been here for 40 years. And I would say those 40 years have been spent uh, fixing either broken or uh, missing measurement and accounting systems. Uh, so I have helped to introduce uh, activity-based costing in cost accounting, which you'll actually see a little bit of in the talk. Uh, the balance scorecard, which is a multi-dimensional performance measurement system for organizations for long-term value creation. And starting three years ago, uh, we discovered uh, in a way another broken system, which is the one that has been proposed to measure the emissions of companies across their value chains. And the solution to this, as I will show you, is actually uh, remarkably simple, uh, but it is actually going to require a blockchain, which will be the end of the talk. And I'm excited about it because this is actually, I believe, one of the most socially useful and powerful applications of blockchain that is yet to arise. Uh, but let me make that case and let me start uh, since uh, I think most of the people here are more technology experts than they are uh, environmental experts. We have to have a little bit of background on uh, carbon accounting measurement 101. Uh, so the key idea here and what the challenge is, is that most companies or universities like Harvard or university systems actually don't emit very many greenhouse gases. Uh, they're pretty low emitters. And as this slide shows, however, their suppliers, if you look across all the products and services that they purchase, which is material purchases or electricity, uh, actually do have a lot of emissions. And if we want to hold organizations accountable for their total carbon footprint, we have to find a way to measure all the emissions that are in the products and the services that they purchase, as well as the ones that they produce themselves. As a very simple example, which uh, I'll be getting back to at the end of the talk, uh, and my own institution, Harvard University, uh, as I said, doesn't have very many emissions, but one thing Harvard does a lot of is build new buildings. And when you put up new buildings, uh, you're using cement, you're using steel, you're using glass. Uh, and the production of all of those materials produce a very high quantity of emissions. And so Harvard is serious about uh, reducing its emissions. It has to be able to get visibility into its supply chain. Now, uh, this has been recognized before. Uh, more than 20 years ago, a group uh, came together uh, to produce what has been called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. And the Greenhouse Gas Protocol kind of picks up on the idea I just said, uh, which is, and they came up with a taxonomy of three types of emissions. First are the emissions that you produce in your organizations with the assets that you own, and they call those scope one. 
Scope two are the emissions in the electricity and the energy that you purchase, uh, that your energy providers are doing. And scope three are all the other emissions from all your suppliers. And interestingly, all your downstream uh, customers and what they produce downstream. Uh, so th this is the basic framework that's kind of widely used and adopted. Now, one of the problems when I encountered this three years ago uh, and why this didn't make uh, a lot of sense to me uh, as an accountant is if you're serious about emissions, and the only emissions that go in the atmosphere are what they call the scope one emissions. Uh, and those are from not just your organization, but I said the emissions of your suppliers and also of your customers. And so in the history of the world, there's never been a molecule of scope two or scope three emissions that has ever entered the atmosphere, uh, despite the diagram that the greenhouse gas protocol uses. And, and it kind of suggests that there's a little bit of a, a problem here in that underlying uh, foundation. Uh, but to get more specific and granular, let's take an organization in the middle of a complex supply chain. Uh, suppose you're the company that is producing the car door for an automobile company, you know, BMW or Toyota. So you can see that in the upper right-hand portion of this slide. And what the greenhouse gas protocol says is we want you to look backwards uh, on, in your supply chain, and in this case, all the way back to the mining company that has produced a mined uh, iron ore, a metallurgical coal, and somehow cal figure out how much of their emissions go into your car door. Uh, and you have to trace this through, which is the transportation company that move the minerals, which steel company uh, process this, uh, and then which fabricating company produce the sheet steel. And, you know, for any mi middle or large size company, you could have tens of thousands of suppliers, two thirds of whom you don't even know their names because they're so far upstream. So how are you, if you don't know the names, how are you possibly going to know how many emissions are in the products that eventually showed up at your facility? And then how are you going to know the emissions that happen in the production by Toyota or BMW or when Bob Kaplan bought the car and drives around and is burning fuel? So this is kind of an impossible calculation uh, to do uh, from the point of view of looking upstream and then trying to look downstream. So we, and what I'm going to talk about today, we're just going to deal with the supply chain emissions. And actually, the solution is remarkably simple. Uh, and it, it just you just have to change where you are standing and which direction you look. So instead of standing in the middle of a supply chain and looking backwards, stand at the beginning of the supply chain where the original minerals are being mined or where the crops are being grown on a farm or where we're extricating uh, oil or gas out of a, a field and calculate the emissions there and then just look forward and send that information to your downstream customers. Uh, and so this turns out to be easy to do. So this diagram illustrates the underlying algorithm. So assume you're a company in the middle of a supply chain and you are getting information from your immediate, your tier one suppliers. And for every product that they sell you, they're gonna tell you what the carbon footprint is. And it could be CO2, just carbon dioxide emissions, or methane, which is another a greenhouse gas. And suppose you were getting this information from all of your tier one uh, suppliers, all of whom you know, because you're purchasing from them. And suppose you can measure your own scope one emissions, that's the upper right-hand box at the top. Uh, and then, to a method just similar to activity-based costing that I helped to introduce, uh, how do we assign all the emissions that we purchased and that we produced to our output products? And that we see at the bottom of this diagram. So the underlying algorithm here, which companies all have the potential to be able to do, is to aggregate all of your incoming emissions in the purchase products and services, your own emissions, scope one, and assign them based on the underlying science and production process to your output products. And now your output products, you can send to your customers. 
and just keep repeating the algorithm as it goes down this uh, supply chain. And uh, just to illustrate this in an accounting sense, uh, if you start in the upper right-hand corner here, uh, that's the original mining company. And uh, they have their purchased emissions because they're purchasing energy uh, to do the mining. And they may have capital equipment in which there were emissions uh, made to produce the big pieces of machinery, which are gonna get allocated to its production. And so you take you know, your, your input emissions and then your own emissions, assign it to your output products, your uh, tons of iron ore and metallurgical coal, or lithium or nickel, whatever you're producing. And then on the left-hand side of that little T account, when you sell those products or trans sell it to your the transportation company, they now assume those emissions. Those become their purchased emissions. They add their own emissions, diesel fuel to run the barge. And when they drop the products off at the customer, steel companies say, these products show up with all the emissions accumulated up to that stage. And then the steel company adds its emissions from running blast furnaces or electric arc furnaces, assigns it to its output products of steel, and then it sends that steel down to you know its customer, uh, and uh, and then that gets same and the same algorithm just keeps going uh, until it goes through the door company. Door company sells it to the car company. Car company uh, does its process, and eventually it gets to uh, you and me uh, when we buy uh, Toyota or BMW. We actually can get a label that tells us here are all the emissions that were produced to get this car to you at the car dealer. So just like we have nutritional labels, we could have emission labels. Uh, and those of us who want to be environmentally conscious can look and, and use that information in our purchase decisions uh, and perhaps choose lower carbon alternatives uh, to encourage companies to decarbonize their supply chain. Uh, so you're, you're seeing is this flow of information that occurs in even the most complex supply chains, but and, and the underlying accounting entry is just an inventory, what we call an inventory equation. Uh, you start with how many emissions you've purchased and produced that you've yet to assign to your customers. Uh, and so that's your opening balance of unassigned emissions. Uh, you add all the purchased emissions uh, in the products and services you purchase. You add your own emissions, your scope one, and you subtract any time you sell a product to your immediate customer. You know, that customer now takes ownership, not only of the product, but of the emissions embedded in the product. And so that comes off your uh, inventory account of carbon emissions. And for those of you that are familiar with value added taxes, or if you're dialing in from India, you recently had a GST tax. Uh, this, that's exactly the way these systems work. At each stage, you know, you, you have the accumulated the cost up to that stage, taxable basis, add in your value added, and that's what passed on to the next stage. Uh, and it allows every company in the world and every university and every health system to have a very simple carbon accounting report, uh, this e-liability report. What's your unallocated balance from previous periods? Uh, how much did you produce this period, your scope one emissions? How much did you purchase? Your material, services, capital equipment. Subtract out how much you've transferred in your output products to your customers, and that's your remaining balance very simple standardized report. Uh, so the neat thing about this, uh, and let me go forward, I'm having trouble reading that small page there in my own slides, is it's a very simple process uh, that each entity is able to take information from its immediate customers, immediate suppliers, add its own, assign it to outputs, uh, and then transfer it to customers. Uh, an advantage of this is that the emissions are counted once and only once, and they're measured where they actually occur. So all we're dealing with is the total scope one emissions uh, that are produced down any supply chain uh, in the world. And no matter how complex your supply chain is, you only have to get information from your immediate suppliers, and you only have to send information to your immediate customers. Uh, so that's the whole, that's the whole algorithm. Uh, 
And uh, so, and the, nope, I'm sorry. And the benefits are, it's not just a reporting system, this is actually a management system because as companies see their total carbon footprint and they under motivation from their shareholders, from their customers, from their regulators, from their communities to reduce their carbon footprint, they actually see that where the carbon has been produced. They can redesign their products for lower carbon components. They can choose lower carbon suppliers, lower carbon sources of electricity or transportation. Uh, and that information then gets passed on to their customers. Uh, that's, that's yeah. And uh, so this is not just a reporting and a measurement system, it's actually a management system to decarbonize supply chains. Uh, where each stage, I hope you can see, is basically about relatively simple calculation. Uh, so just to illustrate, this is the case that I wrote. Uh, and actually this case was taught a few months ago to all 950 first year MBA students at the Harvard Business School. So, and we hope other business schools will adopt the case. So their MBA and undergraduate students will also learn how to do this carbon accounting. Uh, it's a very simple, this was a relatively simple supply chain. It started with a, a, an entrepreneurial company that has found a cement substitute by work, working with uh, cons consumer glass that ends up in landfills. So if we break glasses and wine bottles and discard that, they harvest all this uh, consumer glass that's in uh, landfills, process it, and turns out to be uh, a very excellent and cleaner substitute for cement, which is just about the most polluting material uh, that we have on earth. Uh, and, and so it transmits, uh, it produces this recycled uh, glass cement substitute, uh, and then it sells to uh, and transports it to Boston Sand and Gravel, which is a local company here uh, that mixes it to make concrete. So it takes in other uh, sand and water, other materials, and to create concrete, which can then be used in the building projects that of Harvard University. Now, the problem Harvard University has is it wants to claim credit for using a lower carbon uh, concrete. And we have a very skeptical set of students and faculty and alumni. And so they, they say, oh, that's great. The sustainability says we, we've reduced our carbon footprint by 50% by using this low uh, carbon concrete mix. Prove it. So how are they going to show this? And, and so in, in the case, we walk them through the sequence. Uh, we use spreadsheets to illustrate this. Uh, and, and we start in the lower left, and, and that's the, in effect, the carbon report from the urban mining company. They're mining urban waste, the uh, consumer disposable glass. Uh, and you can see they have a relatively low carbon content, 760. Uh, and then that's what gets passed up to its immediate customer, Boston Sand and Gravel. And to that, Boston Sand and Gravel adds the carbon content from all the other parts of the mix, some of it is Portland cement. You can't, can only do up to say 50% with that cement substitute. It still has to use some amount of Portland cement, which you can see is a very much higher carbon footprint and other materials. And then it produces a report on the carbon content per uh, ton of concrete mix. And then the general contractor that's actually building the building here at Harvard University will inherit that carbon footprint, okay? And, and so that's the flow of information in a very simple two-stage supply chain uh, going from the cement substitute up to the concrete being poured into a new building. So the question is, okay, that's a nice calculation. How do we know it's true? You know, how do we know it's valid? How do we have the confidence that the numbers that you're sending us on your spreadsheet or your E and Y ERP system actually are true and fair. And so we need to be able to audit this information. Uh, and so we finally get to the punchline and why I'm here at this conference. Uh, because what we want to do is the auditing has to occur where the emissions occur, which could be way, way up upstream. And 
And the question is, how does a downstream customer, whether it's Toyota, BMW, or Harvard University, have confidence in the validity and integrity of the numbers that are showing up, you know, in, in the reports coming from their immediate uh, suppliers? And of course, that's where blockchain plays a role. Where if you could, if every organization posts on a blockchain, first the data that I showed you here, you know, what's the kilograms of, of CO2 that were produced for this product at our production process and have not only the quantity, but also the assurance document or the assurance uh, process, however that's worked out and have that both private. So, you know, we, we're not posting this on the internet. This is a very confidential, sensitive information, but it has to be information that a downstream, every downstream customer has to be able to access to see where did the data come from and what type of assurance was associated with it. Uh, and so this is a, to me, uh, and I'm naive, I'm about blockchain, uh, but it seems like this is what blockchain should have been invented for, uh, is to be able to capture information at its source and then transmit it uh, down the supply chain uh, for all downstream customers to be able to do. And some of this has already occurred, not just for, not for carbon accounting, uh, but the block trust, uh, food trust solution by IBM is able to track quality and safety data from farms and plantations all the way to the shelves of Walmart and Target stores. Uh, I guess IBM also had another uh, solution on uh, tracking trade, uh, going uh, shipping. Uh, now, as it happens, I learned that uh, both of these blockchains uh, have been uh, abandoned. Uh, so this is the challenge for all of you out there. Uh, so we, we see the application here in, in carbon accounting and in some of these other applications. But as we design uh, these blockchains, it seems there's at least three criteria that they have to satisfy. One is they have to be affordable. So we know well, we don't have to worry about subsidizing Walmart or Toyota or BMW, but a lot of the suppliers way upstream, you know, could be small companies. Uh, and on the food side, they could be farms and, and plantations. And, and we need them on the blockchain, uh, but we can't make it uh, financially punitive for them to be able to join. Second, uh, again, not all people have big IT departments. As we go, you know, deep up a supply chain, uh, the system's going to have to be easy to use uh, at each of these companies that is being a supplier. I mean, Toyota, uh, Airbus, Boeing, they have 100,000 suppliers uh, out there. And, uh, you know, not all of those have great technological capabilities. Um, so it, ha it has to be affordable. It has to be easy to use. And the third thing is... Uh, not everybody's going to be on the same blockchain. Uh, you know, much as EMY might want to have a, a global solution, everybody's on their blockchain. Uh, it's not likely that will occur or that regulatory authorities would allow it. So this issue of interoperability across people on different technologies, but still allowing the end downstream customer, Walmart, uh, BMW, Toyota, to be able to look all the way upstream, no matter which technology uh, an individual organization would have, does require some degree of interoperability. So, uh, Claire, I think that concludes the remarks and perhaps sets us up for the questions and comments that you have for me. Yeah, I've already exceeded my blockchain knowledge, uh, <laughs> but I can try to clarify anything else that shows up here. No, I'm going to, I mean, I'll be kind, I promise. But I, I think, I mean, it's, uh, it was a, a, a really, as, as, I, as I knew it would be, an extremely well put together story and one that's, the logic of it is so elegantly put together that it's really difficult um, to not buy into what you're showing. But I think towards the end there, you were illustrating maybe some of it, for all its elegance, and its simplicity, which is um, why I think it's so also so robust. 
um, it's not that easy to implement. And so I think my first question for you is around that because we've been talking about, I mean, the Paris Protocol, we go, you can go back quite a few years now. We've been talking about this for quite a long time. I think, I don't know how long you've been looking at the, the whole area, but we've been talking about it a long time and you can argue that maybe we haven't made sufficient progress. So do you think it's, is it because is it because of the accounting process or is there, are there other reasons why you think that progress hasn't been or do you think no. it's slow or do you think like what, yeah. like what, are, what are your thoughts on this in terms of where yeah, are I, we? I think you know, the, the people who uh, developed the greenhouse gas protocol were all well-meaning people. They were directionally correct. We have to really hold companies accountable for their uh, cradle to gate for, uh, to emissions. Unfortunately, even the well-meaning companies, and I'm talking about the Walmarts and the BMWs of the world, they didn't know how to implement scope three. It, it was just not anything that they felt they could do with any degree of accuracy, integrity, and auditability. And so we've been struggling and we've been using industry averages instead of actuals. And, and using averages, it's like running a financial system where you don't measure actual cost of goods sold, you use the average gross margin for an industry. Well, you couldn't have a capital market if the accounting system says, well, we don't know what things really cost, why don't you use an average? Uh, we don't know, no, you gotta know the actual numbers uh, of the items that you purchased and uh, and what you sold, not use averages. So I, I, so I, I, I do feel I, that the, uh, the impossibility, what I showed you in that opening slide of expecting a downstream company to get uh, accurate emissions data from 100,000 suppliers was such a daunting task that uh, you almost didn't know where to get started. No, and there's a knock on effect, right? Because if you're using um, a system of averages uh, what you what you do is you devalue the data. It's intrinsically not as 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 useful and interesting. And as a result, the use of being able to apply it truly robustly as a management system is, is going to suffer for that. To take directional yeah, exactly. decisions yeah. and to you know to to really go into the detail of your supply chain because. What struck me when you were presenting the, the slide that showed uh, the use case with the, the different sort of balance sheets is that you can also see us being in a position with that as part of the management system that it goes into your vendor selection. You know, looking oh, at... Uh, oh, no, of course. For, and, and, without and it a gets doubt, into, right? And it gets into your product design decision. Because if you see you have a high uh, carbon co uh, component, you start to think about, well, is there another component that could serve that same function with less emissions? Exactly. So it, it actually starts at the product design, then it goes to vendor selection. Claire, what you were saying, let, let me have a competition among my vendors, not just on price, quality, and functionality, but also emissions uh, per product. And then the transportation decision, how am I gonna move it from here to there? So one of our projects is with a, uh, it was a hospital and we're looking at the carbon content of a knee replacement, uh, the whole process. And it turns out the, the device, the, the knee implant is the highest carbon in there other than the anesthesia. And they went to the company that was making the implant and they said, okay, we want you to follow this e-liability method. And, and, the comp and the device producer did do that and they discovered Gee, when we make this implant, yeah, we have all the metals in it. We know we have platinum and steel and aluminum and nickel and stuff. But we didn't realize that we, we moved this item back and forth between our UK and our European factory several times in its production process. We have all these transportation emissions that we never really thought of. Well, gee, well, if we want to reduce our emissions, let's try to stop moving it back and forth uh, between our various factories and try to build most of it in one place. Uh, and yeah. even without changing any of the components, that will enable us to have a lower carbon footprint. So yeah. these are the millions and billions of decisions that are going on uh, throughout the world that we want to all inform with valid, accurate information. And when you reduce the carbon content, get 100% of that credit, you know, by, use, uh, by having the actual data. 
So, so do you see this? Uh, it doesn't get away from the other point that you're making, which is if you start at the very beginning, some of these companies are very small companies. If it's the food industry, I mean, you're really going back to raw materials. So you're going back to the beginning and saying, well, this could be a small farm or this could be, you know, these are, these are small companies. So if you're going to start there, uh, how do you make it a sort of a, an easy consumable task for them? And there's sort of two things you need to know is that, first of all, you need to have a common, a common view of you know, that you're actually measuring apples as apples and pears as pears. And how do you, how do, where are we there? Do you think small companies, those very, that, that starting at the beginning of the supply chain, um, are they ready? What, what, what do we need to do to be able to yeah, okay. sort of help so, them get ready? No, I mean, candidly, this, uh, tens or hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers that grow the basic crops that eventually end up in the products we buy. And we're not going to put little measuring instruments in all of their uh, one hectare farms. Uh, so we're going to rely there on engineering estimates. And, uh, and so companies like uh, Nestle and Cargill and uh, Unilever are already investing in, uh, and it could be machine learning, uh, algorithms, AI algorithms that based on the characteristics of the farm and the crops they're growing and how they're growing, that they can come up with pretty good estimates. Yeah. Uh, so this is an engineering problem. You know, we don't want the best to be the enemy of the good. We want to get this, you know, if we can get to within five or 10%, uh, that's likely going to be good enough in those applications. Yeah. So I think we will be developing, uh, you know, various algorithms that would enable downstream companies to estimate to a reasonable degree within a materiality threshold, uh, the emissions without literally requiring uh, small farms or very small producers to uh, be providing uh, auditable data uh, yeah. on those emissions. No, I would say that because this is where, this is where you have to sort of take, take the usage from the full suite of technologies that's available and because the other thing to remember is there's also a geographic component here. Uh, most of the, the companies that you were talking about, the Walmarts and, and so on, when you trace their supply, not only do they have thousands and thousands of suppliers in their supply chain, they're also distributed geographically all over the world. And so you've got very different climates, very different sort of algorithms that need to go into it. And you can already see that, that this is a solution that's probably a, a combination of, 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 of AI with um, some complex algorithms that c has to be delivered in a very uh, light way, right? No, and this is actually a role for your parent company, not the blockchain component, but the assurance function of E&Y would have to review these algorithms and say, yes, these fairly represent the science uh, underlying the emissions production and gives us an estimate uh, w within a material amount, uh, immaterial amount of error that we can rely on. Uh, and so this is an expanded role for the assurance function is, again, not to you know, review these methods that are being used by all organizations to provide us with the data on the blockchain mm. and say, yes, uh, that this this is gives us it fairly presents the results of, of this operation. So th there's a lot of work for the assurance and audit side of uh, the firms to build that capability. Yeah, exactly. And then you make it very easy, as you say, to be able to pass that to transfer that and and through through the tokenization. I, I think that makes it um, uh, um, you 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 retain that. Uh, integrity of the data without a doubt um, but you can also do it with 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 transparency with trust and you can build that into into the solution and that's what what we can do today but I, I still feel that it, this is a journey um, it's definitely a marathon it's not a sprint right uh, oh yeah no one. no uh, this is so good. yeah so it's important when the, when the US passed the Securities and Exchange Act in 1933 it was not until 1939 that we had generally accepted accounting principles that we could apply. Uh, and that took them five years. This is going to take, you know, a, as you say, it's a journey. It's three years, yeah. four years. But we should start on the journey knowing what the endpoint that we want to achieve is. Yeah. 
And that's what I showed you today. This is the destination. And what we need to do is come back and say, okay, what, what can we do in 2024 to start on that journey? And it is going to start with the downstream companies, you know, with the BMWs and, uh, and Toyotas asking their tier one suppliers to get on board with the system. And then the next year, the tier one are going to get the tier two and tier three suppliers on. So that's the nature of the journey. It will, the pressure will come from the downstream companies. They're the ones most accountable, most visible, uh, and have the highest motivation to do this. Absolutely. Uh, but Absolutely. it doesn't take more than 500 or 1,000 of these large downstream organizations to start doing this to really start accelerating the adoption all the way up a supply chain. Well, let's hope that they're let's let's hope they're listening today. Let's hope they're listening today. I have a whole, I've got a ton of questions come in, um, Bob. So I think we should we should try and tackle them. Um, I'm going to start. Let's start, start here. So the first question that's come in is, how do you harmonize scope three emission estimations in a diverse multi-tier supply chain? And I I. I feel like you answered this in part, yeah, but no, I know I, I think I they're think getting to if, the multi-tier yeah, thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So the whole point is just start at the beginning and work your way up. You would never have to use the word scope three again. Exactly. Okay. It, it's or scope two for that matter, because electricity production is just a special case of a, of a supplier. Yes. Uh, and remember, scope one are the only emissions that count. Uh, yeah. So we want to minimize the total scope one emissions down supply chains. Yeah, it's it's really understanding your, your, what's my contribution? My contribution is what am I using and what am I creating? And then what am I passing on? And so it's, it's you're sort of redefining it a little bit, I think. Um, so the next one, oh, this is a good one. It's, and, I, I, and I think it's probably gonna resonate with what you see in the world today. But I, I work, it's somebody that's, I guess from, from our own organization, I work in EY sustainability assurance team. Currently, I'm seeing a lot of redundancy in the audit process. Could you please discuss some ways corporations could build tool sets to improve this process? We're bogged down with a load of calculations mm -hmm. on our scope three especially in the category one and two emissions. There you go. There's someone that's feeling the pain, I think, that, that is no. so going to welcome the, your, your model. Yeah, so if you're following the scope three requirement, so BMW has to come up with its total upstream emissions and it has to get audited. Now, it's each of its suppliers, let's say Bosch is a supplier, it has to go through the same process. So they're auditing, and again, it's the same suppliers, the same tier two all the way down. Then you go to Bosch's supplier, and they're doing the same thing. So it's the we're, it's tremendous amount of redundant auditing. Yeah. And, and so the beauty of this approach is you only audit where the emissions occurred, the scope one emissions. And there's no double, or triple, or quadruple auditing the way you have now. You are, are yeah. auditing once and only once where the emissions occurred. So it's going to, you just have to switch your framework and just think about how this hugely simplifies the process. Yeah. This is a good one. What about services that are indirect but critical to the supply chain, such as finance, insurance, capture? So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that, on the indirect? Indirect well, at some point, I mean, most of the emissions in the financial services are, pro are not very high, uh, you know, but, you know, if you are using a certain amount of financial services, at some point, they have to tell you, based on the hours of use of our, uh, whatever our financial services, whether it's insurance or financial advice or a checking account, you know, how, what, how have you assigned your emissions to those outputs, yeah. you know, so the whole point is, it's, it's not the role, this is again the shift in thinking, it's not the role of a company to ask its suppliers what their emissions are. It's the role of the supplier, you know, whether it's Bosch to BMW or a financial services company to you, to tell you what emissions you just purchased by using our product and service. Uh, and just like scope two, it, it's looking in the wrong direction. It's not the job of a company to estimate the emissions in the electricity. It's the job of the electricity company to tell you, the consumer, here's the, the CO2 per kilowatt hour. So if you go back to that diagram, it's just standing in a different place and looking downstream 
rather than standing and looking upstream. And, and if you just can keep that picture in your mind, it answers basic every question that's occurred so far because you, you're trying to patch up the system that's standing in the wrong place and looking in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and, and this, this next question, I wonder, um, it says, how widely has this approach been adopted? What are the obstacles to wider adoption, if any? So I think this is a, a sort of probably a question on, so how, how far have you spread the news and, and who sort of how many projects have you been working with and, and, and how are companies reacting yeah, so. to it? So uh, three, literally two years ago, shortly after our article was published, we had Karthik and Ramana, my co-author, and I had a conversation with one of the leading financial regulators in the world. And, we'll, and uh, we explained this, and they said, oh, this makes a lot of sense. This is accounting, and I can see the auditing. Uh, and they said, well, who's doing this? Yeah. And there was silence on the call. And we kind of looked and said, well, no one's doing it. It's something we thought of in our office. And the regulator, the chairman of the regulator says, uh, Bob, Karthik, we can't re really impose a standard on all companies that no one has ever tried. And we said, no, you're absolutely right. It's up to us to you know, test it out, find organizations willing to be pioneers here. And so we've worked with several dozen organizations uh, and we've completed them in industries like you know cement and copper production and tires uh and uh you know and, and it works but you know it's a limited set it's a, you know i didn't give you the list uh you know it's a couple of dozen organizations yeah. uh and you know but we have to get I, but we need so we are talking with standard setters we're talking with regulators uh we're talking with people in europe that are putting the uh carbon border adjustment mechanism cbam to say, allow companies to use this method because this is this is a feasible method. It's going to work, and uh, you know if if you can allow it, encourage it, then uh, we can start to get more widespread adoption. But it's an open audit. So Karthik and I were fortunate; we got a little grant that enabled us to hire some staff to actually do projects. You know, we don't get paid for this, but uh, other people. Uh, don't have a, a day job like we do, uh, and, and so we have to pay them. And, and but we, we work for nothing, you know, just to get this out and get the ideas out to organizations. And so, you know, if you're an organization interested in testing this out, you know, write to us. Uh, look up the E Liability Institute, Google that, and uh, you'll get the site and, and let us know. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because you know, we're I, working I don't know whether with we the dairy companies. But we should you know, say the, that the foundation, it, it is E Liability, and, and people can find you there um, if they're interested and they want to try it and they want to like really start, take it as the starting point for themselves. This is really important. So it is E Liability, guys. Take a look. We've got it on the on the registration. So do do reach out. Um, I have some more questions coming in here. Um, what what do you think about differentiating automatic calculations with IoT and blockchain traceability? So I, th I don't know if differentiating is quite the right word or or integrating or it says so to co so as to communicate if auto generated or audited. So basically, what do you think about you know, this building in the logic. So going a step further, we already talked about maybe in, in, in integrating um, AI and the, you know, the data, determining what the data answer should be. But if you were to integrate that with IoT and fully automate the process, I mean, you can think about it in a mining context, sure. for example. No, that'd be great. No, that, I hope That's that wonderful. occurs. And again, the role for the auditors is just to look at the the control, you know, the, the process, see that it's valid, the calculations, and that you have control so that the data keep getting recorded with integrity. Yep. And so the auditors don't have to audit the transaction. They can audit the uh, the process and the controls as they do in, in uh, financial auditing and get a degree of assurance on that. So uh, that, that that's the opportunity. You know, you, you don't want to, we can't run this on Excel spreadsheets for very long. No, you want to get to that same level i mean you've got to remember as well that that is the way that the supply chain has always evolved as well is automation and i mean you can look at a lot of different elements and components of it that have been optimized and and efficiencies brought in and it sort of goes with the territory a little bit um how do we capture the carbon footprint of your end customer for example 
motorists. So 70 okay. to 80 percent of overall emissions are generated by the end users. So this is getting to the consumer end of it. Okay, so okay, so I gotta be candid, and you've hit the one criticism uh, that has been made of e-liability, uh, and that has been valid, is we focus only on upstream emissions, and not on downstream emissions. And we do this for, uh, consciously and uh, deliberately because companies can control their upstream emissions by product design and choice of suppliers and transportation, and they have no control what the customers do. But we've just, Karthik and I just wrote the paper and it will be published uh, in two months from today in Harvard Business Review to answer the, just the question you asked. So wow. what's missing That's from the system? The press, guys. Yes, definitely. So what's missing from the system is what you've just asked. Because uh, we can't expect we're gonna have eight billion consumers on this earth producing their e-liability statement uh, each period. Uh, and so what we found, well, most companies end up not selling directly to consumers. So B2B companies are exempt, uh, but the B2C companies, companies who are selling products that consumers are purchasing, it has their company's name on it somewhere, and that consume or burn energy in order to use the product. You know, so if I buy a, a, a sport jacket, uh, I don't have a carbon footprint when I put it on. Okay, so that so the clothing company is exempt from consumer emissions. But you know, if I'm selling you uh, a package of rice that you have to heat uh, before you, you before you can eat it, okay, or if I'm selling you detergent that has to go in a washing machine to wash your clothes, or I'm selling you an automobile that you have to burn gasoline in order to uh, drive. Well, you have some degree of accountability for the downstream emissions. So uh, so the downstream is, is for things like fossil fuels in you know, when you heat your homes or when you uh, drive your cars or dry your clothes or cook your meals. Mm. And the companies producing those products have some influence. In other words, they can design the products so in use that you will produce fewer emissions when using that product. So if the, the CPG I, I, company know, last half full, cooks the rice, yeah. then uh, you, you don't have to heat it as much. But and I, so- even if, even if it's not part of the initial first pass, I've, I've still got to say glass half full though, Bob, because as a consumer, again, it's an extension of that management system that if you can see, if you have the transparency to see the emissions on the product that you're buying, even before the added emissions that you're causing, okay. you are going to make choices. There are consumers out there that are going to make choices based on that. So okay, but Claire, there's one other point. So that, that gets you on the emissions that have already occurred. Yes. But if we also label the package, which is how many emissions per unit of use, that Even for you, rate. now I, exactly. that becomes part of my decision too. And so if a company like Unilever says, here's this new detergent we produce, and you can wash your clothes in cold water. You don't have to heat the water up. And therefore the emissions in use are lowered by the way I design the product. Or I'm an automobile company and I've designed it, given the aerodynamics, you use less energy per kilometer of driving. Okay, so, so, it's, not just, so it's both the emissions that were produced for the product what you just said, Claire, but it's also informative of here's the emissions per unit of use by the consumer. Yeah, and so that's the, that's the additional disclosure that we are now advocating, but it's not the total emissions of the consumer because I can't tell Claire how, uh, how often she can, should wash and dry clothes or how far she drives her car. Ultimately, the quantity of use is under the consumer's control. Well, what's under the company's control is the emissions per unit of use yeah. by the consumer. Uh, and that's true, you know, if you, if you, uh, you know, using your phone, you know, so uh, how, how many hours do I use it? Now, the designer, the Apple, uh, Samsung can determine, you know, how, how many kilowatts per, you know, hour of use, or how, you know, but they can't control my quantity of usage. So it's, it's a less, uh, you know, stringent form of accountability and it's also not 
quite auditable, you know, because it's an estimate of what we think it will be in consumers' use. But, you know, it'll be a reasonable estimate. And just as you're saying, Claire, it could help consumers make better choices, not only in the uh, emissions to have produced that product, but in how that product is used by them. Fantastic. Well, on that point, we're going to end it there. But thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, listening to you and hearing your ideas. And I'm going to certainly be keeping an eye out for that paper in a, in a couple of months' time. But thank you so much for your time, Bob, and, uh, and being with us today. Okay, well, well, thank you for the opportunity to share these ideas. And, uh, you know, just find us at eLiability.org, and uh, you can be another one of our pilots. Thank you.